Stephen Harper occasionally tells his staff, the longer I'm prime minister, the longer I'm prime minister. It was a reminder that unlike Joe Clark, Kim Campbell, or several other conservative prime ministers in the 19th century, Harper had every intention of being less revolutionary in hopes of hanging around 24 Sussex longer. For more on Canada's 22nd prime minister, the man and his politics, here's journalist Paul Wells. He's the author of The Longer I'm Prime Minister, Stephen Harper and Canada, 2006 till next time. We shall see. Hi, good to have you here, Paul. Thanks for having me. I am going to set this discussion up with a quote from your book. Okay. Ready? Here we go. He would shock the system regularly to keep his opponents off balance, divided or both. He would hoard information for himself and dole it out to the people and to Parliament through an eyedropper. He would never let mere principle deny him any advantage his opponents had used or might use if the tables were turned to hold on to power. He would be nice when he could, reach out when reaching out would help, but when the chips were down, he would not hesitate to demonstrate there could be no bigger son of a bitch in Canadian politics than Stephen Joseph Harper. First question, do you think our Prime Minister would mind that description? Uh, no, he would never say anything like that in public because it's a little salty, but I think that, uh, I think he would recognize himself in that. Did he speak to you for the book? No, he didn't. I flirted with him for a, about a year uh, through intermediaries. Uh, they would ask, you know, what would you like to ask about? Um, what are the themes that you're exploring in the book? They got as much information as they could. They had discussions about whether to talk to me at the senior staff meetings at uh, Langevin Block. Uh, there apparently at some point was a decision to talk to me on the condition that I never reveal that I had spoken to him. <laughs> so if, if I had spoken to him, you'd ask me that question, I'd have to figure out some fancy <laughs> lie. But in the end, even though uh, members of his staff congratulated me on getting an interview with the boss, the boss never actually sat down for the interview. That's funny. But you know him, and, and you have had conversations with him before yes. sitting down to write this book. So I, I've been sort of uh, running across him um, one way or the other for nearly 20 years. Right. Um, most first ministers get elected because they say, here's what I need to achieve in my term in public life, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. What's on that list for Stephen Harper? Uh, he needs to leave less federal government behind when, he, when he's done than he's found when he arrived. And as far as I can tell, he's the first prime minister with that agenda at the item at the top. Uh, even other conservatives, certainly Sir John A., uh, Diefenbaker, Mulroney, Joe Clark, were builders. They wanted to uh, launch projects. Harper is an editor. That's the gentlest term. He wants to uh, constrain the federal government so that it will interfere less in the lives of individuals and communities than it has in the past. Do you know why that animates him so much? He's uh, at heart a libertarian. He believes that uh, less government is, is better government. Uh, he, I mean, you know, so people have tried to depict him as some agent of, uh, of religious extremism. Uh, he's comfortable with devout, uh, devoutly religious people, but that, that's not really what it, what it comes from. He's painted as an agent of the Americans. No, he, uh, he believes in Canada as a community. Uh, he believes that it has been overgoverned, governed and, and he believes that it has essentially been uh, uh, um, rigged to transfer wealth from the West, from the resource producing regions where it nat naturally comes from, to prop up a small set of elites in Ontario and Quebec. And he wants to unrig it. And if the elites fall, that's their problem. His opponents uh, describe him as a hyper-partisan ideologue. You quote one of the MPs in his party as saying, that is not a helpful way to understand him. Why not? Well, because he, he, he won't do the conservative thing first, the small, the small C conservative thing first. He will, he's a team guy. He will advance the interests of the conservative party, even if it means sometimes not doing the conservative thing. So Barack Obama and Stephen Harper got up one morning in 2009 and bought General Motors. That was fine with Stephen Harper. Uh, because that kept the Conservative Party in power, and that's what it takes. Conservative Party is an imperfect instrument, but it is, it is better by, uh, by Harper's lights than the Liberal Party, and that's the salient comparison. So whatever strange contortion he has to go through to keep the Conservative Party in power is fine with him, because it keeps the Liberals out. If you are a fire-breathing libertarian with principles and integrity, mm -hmm. how do those two statements make any sense together? Uh, you uh, tell yourself that uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau said at one point, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And Stephen Harper tells that to conservatives all the time. Uh, when, back when um, Tom Flanagan was uh, still in good with Harper, just before the 2004 election, I believe, 
Flanagan wrote an op-ed where he said to conservatives, look, we are going to try your patience from time to time. We are going to do things that you would not do if you had the only vote, but you don't. We need to move the political culture towards our vision of things, and we can only do that step by step. And in the main, have people in the party agreed with that? Oh, people in the party have, have in the main, with many exceptions, been delighted with this bargain. Uh, it's always worth remembering what preceded Harper's nearly eight years in power, which was four or five years of uh, an imploding conservative movement in this country, and more than a decade of, of being out of power. Mm -hmm. and if you spend enough time losing, then doing what it takes to win starts to look pretty good. Uh, you said a second ago he's a team guy, and mm -hmm. yet I can recall a quote in the book somewhere where he says, essentially, all of you are expendable, I'm not. Yes. That doesn't sound like a team guy. He, that's why I don't have a really strong, tight thesis for this book. This is a hard book to tweet. I decided it was fair, if it's taken him more than a decade to define Harper conservatism, that I could take all 420 pages to explain it. And as I say near the front, if you uh, start to try to pin a label on the guy, if you try and reduce him to 140 characters, uh, he'll break your heart every time. You say he's an incrementalist, he's often been bold. You say he's uh, um, a libertarian, he's often, he's, he's, he's repelled foreign investment, he has uh, nationalized General Motors, He's done all sorts of things that a libertarian would never have done. Uh, he is, in the end, he's the Stephen Harper gut. And the Stephen Harper gut goes where it wants to go. And conservatives in this country judge, by and large, that that is better than the alternatives. Social conservatives, once upon a time, were in love with him. But again, the Stephen Harper gut says, there's never going to be an abortion bill on my watch. Yeah. We're not bringing back capital punishment. Yeah. And I'm afraid gay marriage is probably here to stay. Yeah. So how? How do the social conservatives make their peace with this guy? Uh, pretty well. Um, for one big reason and then, and then a bunch of small reasons. Let me start with the small reasons. You know, if you were told yourself that, being, uh, that people in France wear berets and carry around baguettes, and then you went walking through the streets of Paris, you might think there wasn't a French person in Paris. Because they actually don't wear berets anymore. They actually don't walk around with baguettes. <laughs> there are a million ways to be French. Similarly, if you say, as some of my colleagues do, that the test of Harper as a social conservative is his stance on abortion, he will not ever look like a social conservative. But you know, social conservatives live complex and rich lives. They send their kids off to Bible camp. They, uh, they worry about the safety in the neighborhood. They have a lot of secular friends, and, and they worry about ta uh, the, the tax rates and, and uh, foreign policy and, and a bunch of things like that. And so what Harper says to them is, look, I'm not going to move that big piece, the abortion piece, forward. But you know what? We're going to give you $100 uh, a month for every child you have under six years old. And, and if you're, as a lot of religious families do, if you've got a lot of children, you're going to get a lot of those checks. And you can spend that as you like. You can spend it uh, so that an aunt can come in and take care of them when you're off at the office and things like that. If you want to homeschool your kids, that is fine with me. That starts to be a discourse that is very appealing to a social conservative family. So the, 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 there's starting to be a sort of a modus vivendi between libertarians and social conservatives. There has been for 20 years in the country, and Harper has made it more explicit. So I've sat in on, on discussions, on, on uh, dinner discussions with conservatives who know Harper much better than I do, while they argue about whether he's even a religious man. Hmm. They honestly don't know. Do you know? Uh, I don't know. I know that he goes to church sometimes, but I know I, know I go to church sometimes. <laughs> And, and that doesn't and, make you a religious and it's, man. And it's really sometimes, you know. <laughs> uh, but they know that they've got a better ally in Harper than they would have in the available alternatives. He did something in 2011 that no one's ever done before, and that is he won a majority government after two minorities in a row. Mm -hmm. That never happened. What was in the recipe, in the mix, that allowed that to happen? Uh, the main thing is that once someone had voted conservative, they tended to vote conservative again. So he, he had his base nailed down and then could grow incrementally um, uh, from that base. Why does he have the base nailed down? Well, Brian Mulroney won the biggest uh, um, number of seats in the House of Commons of any uh, government since, uh, since Confederation. And that coalition almost immediately started to fall apart mm -hmm. because he actually didn't look and sound like the people who had voted for him. He looked like he was still preoccupied with who he might run into in the lobby of the Ritz in Montreal. He looked like a guy who uh, wanted the approval of the people who'd been electing Pierre Trudeau. So Harper took notes. Yeah. And he said to himself, you know, there's always going to be tension between the mainstream 
and the motivated base of an ideological party. Hmm. And where Clark and Mulroney always found themselves in the end, whenever there was that tension, apologizing to the center for the excesses of the base, Harper tends more often to apologize to his base for the eccentricities of the center. <laughs> and I think that's why, you know, there's a show called uh, The Walking Dead with, uh, that is about zombies. life after the zombies. And in the third episode, they realize that as long as they smell like the zombies, they can walk among them. Harper always smells like a conservative, so he can walk among them. <laughs> He'll be thrilled with that analogy. Uh, Paul, I, I got to tell you, part of the book I really loved was where you're describing that near-death experience they all ex had when it was still minority government years. And the coalition of Stéphane Dion and Jack Layton, Gilles Ducep comes forward and attempts to, in essence, take over. Yep. What was his big takeaway from that near-death experience? It was an extraordinary moment because Harper had been keenly aware that he had a minority of the vote. He had a minority of the seats in the House of Commons. So he had one big hope and one big fear. The fear was that the House of Commons would find its ground state. It would settle into its natural equilibrium where the median MP became the prime minister and that median MP would have been a liberal. If the opposition ever realized that they outnumbered the conservatives and started to act like it, he was done. And he'd managed to bluff his way through two and a half years and get reelected. And then they did align as the numbers, uh, you know, if he'd been opposition, he would have tried to play that coalition card well, much he did. earlier. Absolutely. He did when he was. Yeah, and tentatively, you know, but if he'd, if he'd been assured of the numbers and of, of, of support, he would have gone much more, um, so the, the only surprise was that it took him that long. And then they started to line up and he thought his, his goose was cooked. His hope was that the people would be behind him. And the amazing thing in that week was not the blurry video of Stéphane Dion, it was not the prorogation. The amazing thing was the public opinion polls because they showed that in a straight choice, do you want Harper or do you want everyone else, um, a workable, plural, a large plurality, a near uh, majority decided they preferred Harper. So but, for the first time, he had the country at his back. But let me follow up on that because the country was at his back, behind him, with him, I guess. Uh, at that moment because he had very skillfully demonized the coalition, suggesting yep. it was illegitimate and illegal, mm -hmm. when in fact it was legitimate and legal. And I wonder whether you, as a guy who has covered parliament, presumably who believes in parliament and yeah. democracy, um, how you feel about the way he demonized our rules in order to get to a conclusion that he wanted. Uh, I've been covering way, politics for way too long to be too surprised when people start to exaggerate the, 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 the failings of their opponents. I listened to liberal cabinet ministers in the old days say that the Canadian alliance was supported by racist bigots and Holocaust deniers, and no, and no one shouted them down. So the, ex the excesses of rhetoric are what they are, and Harper, uh, in some cases, flat lied about the nature of the coalition. Mm. But people can judge for themselves, and what they saw when they looked at that coalition was uh, it was led by a guy who had led the Liberal Party to the lowest number of seats that it had ever had, had already announced his resignation, had three times before the coalition experiment was launched uh, stated explicitly that he was not interested in forming a coalition with the NDP, who didn't have enough seats to control a majority, who didn't have enough seats with the NDP to control a majority in the House of Commons, and couldn't even do it with all the Liberal seats, all the New Democratic seats, and a couple of block, blockists. Mm -hmm. He needed the whole block caucus to support him for a year and a half. And incidentally, he was the Bloc Québécois' worst enemy, or was supposed to be. That was, a, that was a clap trap. It wasn't a viable government. And I believe that if many of the, of the, of the uh, failings I had just described had not been present, Canadians might have been willing to consider a coalition, a working coalition of uh, a solid liberal leader and the New Democrats and, and, and nobody else. You know, there, there, there's all kinds of a coalition is not just the arithmetic majority in the House of Commons. It's what works, realistically, what's going to work. And the, and the, and the demonstration that it was a laughable claptrap was that it was, it was easy enough for Harper to dismantle it. All he had to do was prorogue for five weeks. It should theoretically have been as viable five, five weeks later as it was in December of 2008, but it had already fallen apart. Let's look ahead. Do you think this Senate problem that he has right now um, affects his ability, presuming he's the candidate, we haven't talked about that yet, mm -hmm. to get re-elected in 2015? Uh, it, it sure does. It's a, it's a serious problem. It's a problem because it um, reinforces uh, the notion that 
Um, this isn't really the party of regular people. Th these guys have worked really hard to present themselves as a populist Tim Hortons government. And yet, when the fat cat Bay Street millionaire chief of staff bails out the TV star senator, that does, n none of that sounds like what happens at Tim Hortons. <laughs> so that's a problem. And it also reinforces the notion that he's running some kind of secret operation that he can't really tell us about. If it takes him seven months to still not have explained what went on, you get the impression that what was going on was something that he would find unpleasant to have to explain. Um, but governments have gotten reelected in the middle of scandal before. Uh, I covered Jean Chrétien in 2000 for the National Post when the front page of the National Post had revelations about his Shawinigan hotel dealings every day. Yeah, and, but no uh, one could understand that story. This story they understand. Yes, but, but um, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing is a guarantee. There are no facts mm -hmm. in the future. And uh, Harper will have a compelling narrative of economic success, stability. Uh, he'll have the benefit of incumbency. There's all kinds of reasons to think that he could well survive the next election. But there are fewer predictions at the end of this book than, than there were at the end of my first book about Harper, <laughs> because I'm less certain that I know anything about how this, this is going to pan out. Do you have a view on whether he is running again? I'll be really surprised if he doesn't. Surprised if he does not. There's a moment where every first minister sort of looks down his front bench at the cabinet ministers he's got and mm -hmm. thinks to himself, who's a better bet to continue this, me or one of them? Yeah. When he does that, what goes through his head? He says that uh, uh, he's got experience, uh, he's got toughness that some of the others might lack, he's not interested in pleasing uh, opponents, which can never be done. He's not interested in pleasing the press gallery, which is never worth as, as much as the effort. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, uh, Canadians have, not, uh, millions of Canadians have really never grown to trust this guy. But enough Canadians have grown to trust him, and they've been voting Conservative again and again, and it's become a habit. And you don't want to break that habit. In Australian politics, they pay more attention than we do in Canada to a simple notion called incumbency, which is the idea that people, will, people are likelier to vote for uh, uh, someone they voted for in, in the past. And that's why the NDP is in trouble now, because it was no one's choice. Jack Layton passed away. Mm -hmm. But the, the four elections in a row that the NDP grew its, its popular vote, that's now in jeopardy. The Liberals thought they were being smart, getting rid of the guy who won three majorities in a row. It turned out not to be so smart. That's Crutchin you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Harper knows that at some point uh, it'll be time for him to go. And I believe that he thinks about that more consciously uh, and more objectively than a lot of politicians do about themselves. The conventional wisdom, though, is that you get about a decade. And yeah. he won the leadership of that. But Well, he, he participated in his first election in 2004. Yeah. So 2014 is a decade. Yeah. So um, conventional s wisdom has not always been true about him, mm -hmm. but uh, he will like so. For instance, he will tell himself that at the next election he will still be three years younger than Kretchen was when Kretchen won his first election. Hmm. Uh, he will. But I mean, all of this is on his mind, hmm. uh, and I offer no guarantees. You know, I. I <laughs> the, the thing is, people have been predicting it was the end of Harper just about every year since he got into this game. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2005, the summer of 2005, I was at a dinner in Calgary where the mood around the conservative table was pretty mournful. It, it's too bad that Harper hasn't worked out and now we're going to have to let him lose the next election. And then, and this was six months before he became prime minister. Two of the people at that dinner table are ministers in his cabinet today. So I've been hearing obituaries for Harper uh, for as long as I've been covering him as a, as a party leader and he keeps forgetting to show up for the funeral. So I'm not going to write another obituary. <laughs> Last question, Paul. 420 pages later, yeah. and you've lived this book for a long time. Yeah. Do you like him? Yeah. Uh, I think that in his heart, he means well for the country. Um, I, uh, I do want to take him aside and say, you know, Prime Minister, you don't have to be as big of an SOB as you sometimes are. Uh, toughness is, uh, is one of a panoply of her, uh, human virtues, and you're allowed to show the others. Uh, but I, uh, I got a, uh, you, you're embarrassed to admit this in a country like Canada. I got a soft spot for winners. I've got a soft spot for people who are good at what they do. And I, uh, I had more fun covering Kretchen, because Kretchen uh, did it w with more of a smile. But I have uh, very much enjoyed uh, trying to figure this guy out thinking that from time to time I believe I've gotten close. And, uh, and, and the thing that's gratifying about this book is 
I've written a calm book about a guy who makes people angry. And I've written a book about a polarizing figure that people tell me they enjoy whether they're on the left or the right, whether they like this guy or want to see the back of him. And so, um, and, if, and if Canadian people send him back, I'll write another book. And if they send me Tom Mulcair, I'll write about Mulcair. I've got to tell you something. That's a terrific book. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. You did a great job on that book. Thank you, Steve. The Longer I'm Prime Minister, Stephen Harper and Canada, 2006 until we shall see. Paul Wells, thanks so much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.